you should be moving with intention. Why am I moving abroad? What am I hoping to get out of it? Right. And these things will all guide your finances. Also, where are you in the circle of life? Are you a student? Are you mid-career? Are you a professional? Are you executive? Because if you're a student, maybe you don't have that much money. If you're executive or mid-level career, you've got investments, you might have real estate, you might have a lot of other things that you have to wear. You might have kids, you might still have to contribute to their education. I've been in this space in financial services and banking, two top banks in their expat and international banking divisions, one of them running. People get ready to move abroad, they don't think about finances. That has not changed in 25 years at all. Hey everyone, welcome to Flourish in the Foreign, the podcast that elevates and affirms the voices and stories of Black women living and thriving abroad. This podcast centers living abroad as a pathway to wellness, and wellness here can mean and does for our guests financial, professional, physical, mental, emotional and spiritual wellness welcome to the show welcome back if you're returning thank you very much i am christine job the host of this here podcast and also a black american expat living and thriving here in barcelona hello everyone thank you so much for tuning in i am so grateful for you And as I said before, I am the host, creator, producer, and everythinger of this here podcast. And this podcast truly is a labor of love, but labor nonetheless. And that is why I'm asking all of you to please support this podcast. There are five ways for you to support Flourish in the Foreign. Number one. Become a Patreon supporter of Flourish in the Foreign by going to www.patreon.com slash Flourish Foreign. There you can select whichever tier you feel most comfortable. And the benefits of becoming a Patreon supporter really range from community access, bonus episodes, live Q&A replays, and monthly chats with me. So please consider becoming a Patreon supporter today. Speaking of live Q&As, the live Q&As are actually open to the entire Flourish in the Foreign community, so all of you listeners. And if you want to attend the live Q&As, which are on Sundays, just be sure that you are signed up for the Flourish in the Foreign newsletter. That's all you have to do. And then I send out the meeting details and you can come and have a conversation with us. The replay, like I said before, is only available to Patreon supporters. This Sunday, we do have Jamila. Jamila's episode, Dancing Tango from Seattle to Buenos Aires. She is going to be our guest this Sunday. We're gonna talk about her episode and we're gonna talk about wellness in a really deep way because she is a therapist. We're going to talk about how to remain healthy from preparing to moving to living abroad. So please join us. And of course, if you have any questions for Jamila, be sure to submit them or just show up to the chat. The second way for you to support Flourish in the Foreign is by Cash App. You can Cash App the podcast at dollar sign Flourish Foreign. Cash App is really cool. It's kind of like a tip jar. So if you are listening to an episode that really moves you, if you hear a story that's just incredible, and you're just like, look, I want to contribute, but maybe not in a monthly way, no worries. Just Cash App the podcast at dollar sign Flourish Foreign. The third way you can support the podcast is by placing an ad within the podcast or sponsoring an entire episode of the podcast. If you have a business or service or an organization that is in alignment with this podcast and you want to get in front of this incredible audience of just ambitious, educated, internationally minded black women, go ahead to Flourish in the Foreign's website, www.com. 
flourishintheforeign.com slash contact and drop me a line and we will figure out how we can collaborate. The fourth way you can support Flourish in the Foreign is by sharing this podcast. It is super important to share this podcast across your own social media, your Insta stories, your Twitter, your Facebook, all of it. This way, people know that you are giving the podcast your own seal of approval. It is way better marketing than I could ever do. So please, if you are loving this podcast, please share this podcast with your network. Tell them why you enjoy it and maybe even give them a specific episode to start with. Be sure to tag the podcast across social media at Flourish Foreign and Follow the podcast across all social media at Flourish Foreign. The fifth way you can support Flourish in the Foreign is by subscribing to the podcast, giving the podcast five stars, and leaving a review. I always tell you guys I really enjoy reading the reviews. They are just bright spots in my week. I am always so pleasantly surprised and really humbled. So please write the review. It's really amazing for me, but also it helps people to understand what this podcast is truly about. All right. I just gave you guys five different ways to support this podcast, and I hope you chose at least one way to support Flourish the Foreign today. All right. So this next message is brought to you by the Democrats Abroad Global Black Caucus, and they've asked me to share this with all of you Americans who are currently living abroad. It is not too late for Americans who live abroad to request their absentee ballots, but the deadlines are quickly approaching. Visit the nonpartisan website votefromabroad.org now to complete your ballot request form and return it to your local election office in the USA. It only takes a few minutes. If you are concerned that you may not have enough time to return your ballot to your local election authority before the deadline, you can also vote immediately with a backup ballot known as the Federal Write-In Absentee Ballot, or FWAB. In addition, trained volunteers from Democrats Abroad are available on Zoom every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday until the election to offer one-on-one -on -one help and answer any questions about voting from abroad in real time. You can get more info on this by going to www.democratsabroad.org slash global underscore voter underscore assistance. All right, now on to the next story. The next story is of Lisa, and she has had such an interesting career abroad. And she is going to share not only her journey abroad, but some of the fundamental things that we all need to think about when we are trying to stay abroad and thrive abroad, and that is finances. But I'm going to let her tell you all about it. My name is Lisa R. Mitchell. And let's just say I'm Generation X, over 50. And currently I am stateside. I'm back in my hometown of New York City. My mom's family is from the Caribbean. So we always had people like Jamaica, Canada, and I went to Canada as a child. But my first real expat living abroad on my own, living and working abroad, it was 21 and I moved to London and basically working in the financial capital of Europe and working on their version of Wall Street. This was even before Canary Wharf. This was kind of uh, hot and haze. I was on a work abroad program. So graduated from college early, then spent six months saving up money to work abroad because I knew I couldn't afford to just kind of study abroad and went to London and the rest they say is history. If you talk to friends that have known me, I've always only focused on international and always said I would live abroad. Like I said, my mom's family is from Jamaica, so we always had people who studied in England, who worked in Cuba, who coming to and from Jamaica. But as a child, I did not travel that much. But I can't really remember a time when I did not say I'm going to have an international career and I'm going to live abroad. 
maybe it did come from the exposure I had from my mom's family. But again, that was kind of the Caribbean. And yeah, maybe I had some aunts who studied in London, but certainly no one that I knew from the U.S. had said, I'm going to move abroad. I'm going to live and work abroad. No one was really doing that, but it's something that I always wanted to do. There was never any question that I was going to do it. Started kind of studying languages when we were really early in school. Got to college, only focused on international political science. As a result, I kind of don't know that much about U.S. uh, politics, I'm finding out, because I only studied international. When I chose a business school, only went to a business school, Thunderbird, that is the granddaddy of international business, was never interested in any other school or anything. All my career goals have been around international, international banking, global education, I asked Lisa what it was like working in London. I had always worked all through college, always saved up money. I'm one of those people who believes in ABE, always be earning. So it would never have occurred to me to like go backpacking for six months or do something like that and not have an income. So in looking for programs, I knew I wanted to go overseas after college that only really left work abroad or study abroad. And I knew study abroad wasn't going to work. And also, I think I recognize when you live and work in a country, that's very different from travel. It's a very different experience. And it also gives you very different skills. And I recognize that I wanted those skills. And, and that's been a current theme, really, throughout my global career. I, I think for me, it was all excitement. I'd saved up my money. I was excited to be moving to London, looking for my own apartment. The the organization that I went through, which is still in existence, CIEE, Council on International Educational Exchange, and they still have some work abroad programs. That was great. And then they put you in touch with employers who hire people from the program. So one of the things that my mom always made us do is she always made us, she's both of my parents really into education, but she was always like, you need practical skills as well. You never know when you're going to have to work your way through college. So I had all the computer skills. So that made it very easy. And I liked financial services and financial, I still do. Financial services is necessary for everything that we do. So that was an easy fit, had some different assignments, but I always, the, the longest assignment that I had was working for um, Citibank. So here I was working for a top global bank, kind of on their foreign brokerage desk with foreign uh, brokers from all over the world. And my major responsibility was sending out a global report on the equities market and sending that to the US. So that was that was pretty, I remember someone coming to the office to, to do something and they're like, you're 21, you're kind of pretty young to be like living and working and traveling. So for me, it was good. And then I also got to travel all around Europe. So at 21, I was in Paris. I was in Italy. I was seeing all the monuments I had dreamed about. And and this is before internet at all. This is really old school where I'm walking around with my tour book and my Eurail pass and sleeping on trains and staying in youth hostels and going from country to country and calling in phone booths. Do you have a room for the night? So I think it was all a good experience. Again, it teaches you life experiences. If you can operate in a foreign country and make a living and make a home and do it by yourself on your own with very little help, that that takes a lot of guts and courage and resiliency. So the work abroad program, you could only work legally for six months. So I was there for six months and I came back and I came back into a recession I couldn't really find the international job that I wanted, which was fine. Found a job in publishing, learned a lot. I liked magazines. I still do. I like writing. I still do. But always knew I would go to business business school at some point. Had some small businesses. Again, this is way before online. This is selling products physically. So did a lot of things like that, but always knew I would go to business school and always knew I'd probably end up in financial services. 
I asked Lisa what it was like moving back abroad to London and what was her experience this time around? So I went back to live overseas, actually right before the last financial crisis. Sometimes my timing is not that great, 2010. And what I did then was moved overseas for career, back to London and for love. And then the financial crisis happened. So I moved back. Luckily, I had taken a sabbatical and I had a job to go back to. And then while I was working, decided I still want to live overseas. If it's not going to happen in the confines of my job, I need to make it happen. I'm a very much chart your own course, bring your own chair to the table, pull up and do what you need to do. And also the financial crisis showed me who knows what's going to happen with financial services. You should always be able to pivot and have other skills. So that was an opportunity for me to do a skills assessment, see what else I'm good at, what else I would like to do. And that's kind of how I ended up in Shanghai. I asked Lisa to tell me more about her experience living and working in Shanghai. So in Shanghai, I was a director of educational investments for a global education company. And basically teaching English and communication skills, but also really what they wanted was to teach the soft skills. So teaching mid-level executives, some senior executives of global corporations. And when we say teaching them the soft skills, we mean presentation skills, communication skills, influencing skills, because these are executives, managers who are going to interface with their Western counterparts. And especially for cultures like Asia, it's totally different. They don't have the same communication styles. They don't have the same hierarchy styles. So you're teaching them to operate in a global environment, primarily in a Western environment. And these are folks who've been taking English for a very long time, but you're really teaching them their communication skills, how to present, how to answer questions, how to deal with adversity, how to deal with different culture norms. So I did that for four years and that was great. That was, that was a good experience in Shanghai. I was curious to know why Lisa decided to leave Shanghai and return to the United States. I came back to the U.S. for a number of reasons. While I was in Shanghai, I had an illness, but I also have elderly parents. And I'm also a big believer, like I said, you need to pivot. And I always said I would come back to China and pivot to something else when my mentors left. So one of my mentors who had brought me into the company, he left. And also the president of the company, he left. And he had also kind of been a mentor. And I was like, okay, it's time to, it's time to come home and figure out what I'm going to do next. And at that point, I had been working on a book about managing your finances for people who live a global lifestyle, because I had been an international banker. I had been exposed to the global mobility industry, dealt with a lot of expats, digital nomads and managing their finances. But writing the book, in China was a little bit challenging, basically because of their firewall and some other things. So I really used it as kind of on the ground research because there were a lot of expats in China. I asked Lisa to describe the different work cultures she's experienced while working abroad. Well, the work culture in London, it could be a little hierarchical. I think that's probably the biggest takeaway that it's a little bit more hierarchical than in the U.S. I also managed an office in the U.K. and in Hong Kong during my time in banking. So I had staff in in Europe as well. So I would say it's definitely a little bit more hierarchical, a little bit more in some ways buttoned down. Working in Asia, it's definitely hierarchical. It's definitely you don't speak your mind. You don't, you're not necessarily allowed to be independent, although I did get away with it. It's hard to kind of dampen that. You can't just really turn it off. And so it was very hard to not speak my mind sometimes. It's definitely a culture of relationships in Asia, in China. In the U.S., it is who you know, but in Asia, it really is. They In China, they call it guanqi, your relationships, who you know. China at that time as being a superpower, also very competitive environment. At that time, everybody wants to be in China. When I say everybody globally, 
you meet people from all over the world and they were all trying to get a foothold in China. So you kind of have to deal with that. And of course, being a person of color, that's not something you see in Asia a lot. In Europe, I would say, despite what people think, people of color are different. You know, this was like the 90s and someone I was working for, he called me colored. And I was like, what? (laughs) Colored? Excuse what? He's South African. And I was ready. I was like, who are these people? What's going on? But the black British person, she didn't have a problem with it. I was like, did you hear what he just, he called both of us colored. She was like, oh yeah. And those issues were far and few between. Because when you live overseas, often you are seen as American first. I asked Lisa about dating and what her experience of dating abroad had been like. So my dating life always improves while I'm abroad. I don't know why. Um, Well, I do know why. I think I'm a lot more social. I have a lot more time. Work balance is always a lot easier for me when I'm overseas. And also, because I'm alone, I have to make more of an effort to build a community. So I just stay open and flexible. Like my friend says, date people who want to date you. And I like to meet people and I get to know people. So it's never been um, a problem. I think what is an issue is kind of big cities and also the expat lifestyle tend to be transient. So people are coming in and out and a lot of times you end up in a long distance relationship. Well, you need to decide, are you going to move? What are you going to do? Are you going to manage that? But my social life always thrives when I'm overseas. That's really a priority for me. So it's always been a real plus for me. You don't want to go to a foreign country and all you do is work. Right. And then you leave and all you've seen is the airport and maybe the 7-Eleven. You want to have a vibrant social life. I asked Lisa to describe the different healthcare systems she has experienced while living abroad. The healthcare system, the UK is socialized medicine, and I never really had to engage with it besides going to the pharmacy and getting medication. And the thing to know is some medications in some countries are what we consider prescription or over-the-counter in other countries and vice versa. But I did have to engage in the healthcare system in China. Most foreigners who go to China will tell you everybody knows the air quality is a problem. So you'll get an upper respiratory infection. Most expats have who lived in China, I found out, have a story of hospitalization. China hasn't quite figured out if they want, because a a lot of my students actually were in the medical field, um, because a a lot of our clients were uh, pharmaceutical companies, because they follow the Western training. So I had that benefit that I learned a lot from the students. Most of people in China who worked in pharmaceuticals were doctors. So I had that. And they were still trying to figure out, well, do we follow the United States medical care system? Or do we follow Europe or Canada? Where, where do we kind of want to be on that? And they have a bigger issue because they have 1.3 billion people. So having gotten sick now, if you break your ankle, sure, you can go to a local hospital in China. I had something more serious and it required hospitalization. So I went to a Western hospital. I received excellent care. I had excellent doctors and it wasn't expensive. I think I went to a specialist and it was like $100. And it was all Western medicine from the top pharmaceutical companies. So it was fine. But I got uh, uh, hospitalized very early in my tenure in living in China. So... I kept my health insurance in the United States, which I advise everyone to do. And this is before Obamacare. This is like I had COBRA, which when you quit your job, you can keep your insurance for like up to 18 months. And I had that. And that was a lifesaver. Still, I had a five-figure hospital bill, which is not uncommon. And like I said, I'd only been there five months. So I was trying to figure out, well, what kind of expat healthcare policy I should do, but I didn't have a chance to do it. Yes, I had healthcare working through my company, but most of the time you're on a local contract, unless you're on an expat where your company from the U.S. is sending you overseas, you're going to be on a local contract that's local insurance, that's a local hospital. 
most local hospitals in a lot foreign countries will have a Western wing. Sometimes that Western wing just means people speak English. It doesn't mean that the service is better. So you really have to know. And I would say with COVID-19, this is going to be a game changer. I see a lot of people say, oh, I don't need travel insurance. I didn't need travel insurance for 20 something years until I did. China. And then actually in 2017, I was in Thailand and was looking for a spot and fell and cracked my elbow. And luckily I had travel insurance. So you need to figure out if you need travel insurance, if you need a long-term expat policy, you need to have something that covers repatriation of remains, sadly, in case you die. You need to have evacuation insurance. And a lot of countries, I guarantee you, there are already some countries, what is it, Cuba, the Czech Republic, who require you to show proof of insurance. Thailand just did this, which is a big blogger haven. I guarantee you a lot of other countries are going to require proof of insurance, especially for U.S. citizens, because they know COVID-19 ravaged most states. But they know our, our healthcare system is crap. And they know a lot of people come, they come overseas because they want to enjoy a better healthcare system, but they haven't necessarily paid into it, which is also becoming a really big problem overseas. I asked Lisa to describe the biggest mistakes people make with their finances while living abroad. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a tax accountant or this is from all my experience, all my research. That's my disclaimer. So first of all, when you're moving overseas, right, you really should move. And and these are things that I've learned. I've not done everything perfectly. You should be moving with intention. Why am I moving abroad? What am I hoping to get out of it? Right. And these things will all guide your finances. Also, where are you in the circle of life? Are you a student? Are you mid-career? Are you a professional? Are you executive? Because if you're a student, maybe you don't have that much money. If you're executive or mid-level career, you've got investments, right? You might have real estate. You might have a lot of other things that you have to work. You might have kids. You might still have to contribute to their education. And then I see people move abroad. First of all, and I've been in this space in financial services and banking, two top banks in their expat and international banking divisions, one of them running People move abroad, they don't think about finances. That has not changed in 25 years at all. And that's probably your biggest mistake. Or let's say your company's sending you over say, oh, my company will take care of everything. I don't have to worry about that. I had that conversation with someone I met at a conference last year in Singapore. That's wrong. You should always have a handle on your finances. And ultimately, it's your responsibility. You don't just need a budget. You need a financial blueprint. And I'm actually coming up with kind of a template blueprint that I'm, I'm going to hope to give to people. You need to know what your expenses, you need to split things between your host country, which is you can call it your host foreign country. What are going to be your expenses there? Where are you getting your income from? What are your expenses in the United States that you're still going to have to deal with? So you need a plan. How are you going to manage your investments? How are you going to manage contributing to your retirement? How are you going to manage taxation in a foreign country? How are you going to manage your U.S. credit? How are you going to manage identity theft? And people don't think about this, these things at all. This is a key mistake. Oh, I'm going overseas. And I say, oh, that's great. What currency are you getting paid in? Oh, I don't know. What currency is the country that you're going to? Oh, I don't know. You need to know that. You need to know how you're getting paid. You need to know your sources of income. One of the biggest challenges for me, I think, was getting paid monthly, which I hated, and having to sign an employment contract. We don't do that in the U.S. Most jobs don't. It's work at will. And we certainly very rarely get paid once a month. So you need to align your finances uh, to do that. The other thing is now, especially we've seen with COVID-19, you cannot rely on just your employer, just one employer. You need multiple sources of income, right? You, you need to list out, this is most important, what your sources of income will be. And people just don't do that. The other one besides foreign exchange is how are you going to move money, right? My student loan is due, it's due tomorrow. Well, if I'm getting paid in RMB, let's say my student loan is with Citibank, they're not going to take that. So I need time to move my money, exchange the money, and then move it 
and then pay my financial obligations. So you need to look at what your financial obligations are going to be. A lot of people don't think about moving money. Also, people get so focused. Well, I want to move overseas and I want to save money. Well, that's great. You're putting savings in a foreign country, in a bank account. Well, how are you going to get your money out? A lot of people with COVID-19 got stuck at home. It happened during the Chinese New Year. They didn't realize they couldn't get their money out if they're in another country. You can't just always use an app or call the bank to get your money out. So you always want to know that. You always also want to have a plan B. What's your, what's your escape plan? Something COVID-19 happens or, or another financial crisis happens? Are you going to be able to go to another country? Do you have a home to come back to in the U.S.? That's something to think about. In the U.S., credit is king. In other countries, cash is king. Always have cash on hand. Always have cash in multiple countries. Always have a bank account outside the foreign country you're in. And another one in your home country, I like to call it a third bank account. Maybe it's just an account that's online, somewhere in online mobile space, but that you can get to. Always make sure you know your ATM withdrawals. What's the amount? What's the maximum? And make sure you know whether that's calendar day or business day. The most important thing is you need to think about these things pre-departure. We've talked about health insurance, which is a non-negotiable. You should not be leaving to go anywhere, or any country to live or work or even travel without some kind of health care policy that includes evacuation, that includes repatriation of remains. Another mistake I see people, their obsession with getting a local credit card and getting local credit and not understanding the credit terms in the foreign country. I was going to apply for a credit card in China. I couldn't even read the application. My Chinese is never going to be good enough that I'm going to be able to do it. Should I be applying for credit? And do I understand the credit system in China? I'm so credit trained and I've called on a lot of banks in China when I was a banker, but it's still something I wouldn't do. And a lot of people become obsessed with that. I asked Lisa to talk about credit and whether the concept of credit, as Americans may know it, is the same abroad. First of all, there is really no global credit score. Credit histories don't move. They don't travel. There are a couple of companies now that are working so you can have an international credit score. You have to kind of know what you're signing up for. Try to have an understanding of the local credit laws, right? In some countries, like in the Middle East, you don't pay your debts, you go to jail. Some countries not paying your debts or your credit might be tied to your immigration. Remember, privacy rules are different in countries. I read someone, she's married to someone who's Israeli, and they were saying they were going out of the country on a trip and they were at the border at the airport and they pulled out something. Oh, you didn't pay these bills. You still owe these debts. Well, how would they know that? That's because privacy rules are different in other countries. So I would say credit is definitely one. And if you do decide, if you're already living abroad, and you intend to come back to the U.S. at some point, you want to make sure that you're not credit invisible and that you've developed a thin file, right? People go, oh, I'm going to pay off all my debt. And okay, but then if you need to come back to the U.S., you'll be starting as if you were an 18-year-old child. A lot of people who live overseas often, they'll find that their credit score has taken a hit. Maybe utilization has changed. Or again, they've closed all their credit lines and their credit invisible. They're just like someone who moved to the U.S., Living overseas, you always have to worry about identity theft. I mean, having a digital virtual mailbox. I always advise that. Do not rely on relatives. Yes, your grandmother or your mom is very nice. Maybe you're getting something in the mail you don't want them to see. But also, you want to make sure that you're managing your mail, online mail company, a virtual mailbox. They're going to scan every piece of mail They can send you your mail wherever you are. And identity theft is huge. What if elderly people or baby boomers, they're ripe for the picking for identity identity theft and fraud. And you don't want to find out maybe they had a family member living with them and they stole their identity and then they stole your identity. Make sure you're checking your credit report before you leave the country and while you're living abroad. You can do that at annualcreditreport.com, I think, for free. Always use a a VPN, virtual private network, always like that. I I even use one here while I'm in the United States, which encrypts what's going on on your computer and protects it. If you have to just use Wi-Fi, always make sure you have a, a, a password with it. Always protect your passport. Never let it out of your sight. 
right? Because once that's gone, that's it. It's always protect your bank data in terms of your credit. You want while you're living abroad. Also, don't forget about your children and their credit as well. You want to do a credit freeze, credit alert, and credit monitoring. And you always want to do that during your whole time living overseas. I asked Lisa to talk more about taxes. Well, the IRS could care less. You're a U.S. citizen, your tax don't wear a white income, right? So remember in taxes, U.S. citizens, U.S. permanent residents, tax don't wear a white income. That's federal. Then some states may want to tax you, and then the local country will want to tax you. Now, there are ways you can minimize double taxation, foreign tax credit, uh, foreign housing exclusion or deduction, and the foreign earned income exclusion. And one thing I want to say about the foreign earned income exclusion, I see people all the time on Facebook, oh, you can just exclude up to 100 because it changes every year. So I think now it's 105, 900. That is not an automatic. The U.S. government doesn't say, hey, Lisa, you went overseas. No, you have to fill out a form and you have to qualify for that the physical presence test or the bona fide residence test. And post 2010, we live in the world of FACTA and FBAR. But even before that, you always had to file your taxes. People confuse filing and having a tax obligation. U.S. citizens are taxed on worldwide income. It's the filing that will get you. I also asked Lisa how one should properly vet a financial advisor. What happens is, Expats, especially Western expats, Europe, US, we're thought of like, we're just overflowing with money. You move to any major financial enclave, Hong Kong, Shanghai, London, you're besieged with financial advisors, I put in quotes. And for US citizens, since a lot of investments that you could have, the IRS takes a very uh, dim view. There's a lot of reporting and there's a lot of penalties and taxation that could take place. You really need someone that understands, again, that works with people who live a global lifestyle and who can sit down with you and understand what your strategy is. The other thing is you need to have a strategy. Again, I had a friend who were in China and she goes, I'm trying to invest. She was trying to do trades. And I'm like, you're in China. You think your U.S. brokerage account, you think you can just go online and do it and it's not going to be a problem? And she goes, oh, I didn't even think about that. So before you move overseas, you need to have an investment strategy, right? And you need to have someone that understands what are your, what are your goals going to be, right? Okay, I'm living overseas and I'm going to be living there for five years. Do you have a portfolio already? Are you going to be investing? You're moving overseas. Is that going to be the first time you're investing? The United States, good, bad, or indifferent, we have a really good financial structure. You can invest in anything from the U.S. and you don't have to open anything foreign, which subjects you to a lot more scrutiny from the IRS, a lot more reporting. So you really, that's what you need to think about. But Again, does your advisor know how to work with people who live a global lifestyle? Does he understand the rules for PFIX, passive passive foreign investment corporation, which is just like pooled investments? Does he understand about FACTA and FBAR? Does he know what type of investments to put you in? Does he or she know how you can automate your investments while you're overseas? Is he in line with what your goals are going to be? Say you're living in Spain for three years, but then you want to live somewhere else for two years. Those are the questions you need to ask. And you need to, you need to know a lot of people. I see a lot of people. It's easy to get when you live overseas to get kind of seduced by some of these local advisors. Then you find out that you invested in these foreign products that you don't know about or that have some real tax ramifications that you hadn't planned on. Now, if you're sticking with someone who's in the U.S., well, obviously, the things you did pre-departure before you moved overseas in terms of vetting them and, and, and knowing about their credentials, that's what I would say. A lot of people in China, I would ask, are you cert- – actually, I think at the time in China, people didn't necessarily need to be certified. So what does that mean? Anybody can sell investments? So those are some of the – you don't want that. So you also – 
again, like with taxes, would I hire an investment professional that hasn't lived overseas, that hasn't experienced this? Probably not. I want someone who only works with people who live a global lifestyle. That's kind of where I am. That's my advice for people. On the podcast, I have showcased women who have brought their children abroad or who have had children abroad. And I asked Lisa to discuss what were the financial implications or at least some of the things to think about when having children abroad. For Valentine's Day, I do an article about moving abroad for love and some things you need to think about. So again, what's your why? How did you end up abroad and how did you end up having a child abroad? And why would you do that? Because there are some people, I have fr- uh, f- friends, they choose, they may be living abroad on an assignment with their partner and they choose to come home. They do not want to have their child in a foreign country. So why are you even doing that? If you have a child in a foreign country, right, is that child going to be a citizen? Are you choosing that? You have to go to the U.S. Embassy and do that. If you're having a son in certain country, not even a son, maybe a daughter, is that child going to have to be subject to do compulsory military? So those are some of the just things that you need to think about. And finances, where are you having this baby? Is it safe? Is it cheaper? What do you mean by, what do people mean by cheaper? I was just in Thailand last year for Thanksgiving and in Bangkok where the healthcare is excellent. There are excellent hospitals. And one of the women who just had a baby, she didn't think it was that. She was giving out some forms and figures. What are your reasons for having your, your baby abroad? Now, most countries have better maternity benefits than they do in the United States, meaning you could take off time from work, you'll get paid, the father can do paternity leave. So those are good reasons, even though it's changing a little bit in the U.S. for the better. If you're not married and you're having a child abroad, what does that mean? Whether you're married or you're not married, you need to be having a financial discussion with your partner about how things are going to be happening happen. If you're not married, you need to definitely have a cohabitation agreement, which spells out what you're going to do. What are you going to be like Carrie from Sex in the City? She moved overseas with the Russian. Who pays for your apartment? What if things don't work out and you've given up your life in the United States? Can you, if you have a child with someone overseas, can you bring the child back with without the far, father's permission? We know that's a a big issue with, with uh, child kidnappings overseas. So you need to think about that. Obviously, you need to be saving as much money as you can. You need to figure out if you're going to have your child in a private hospital, a public hospital. Are you part of the healthcare system in this foreign country? That will guide a lot of things, or you're paying for it out of pocket. I've seen some people pay for it out of pocket because it's just cheaper. Safety is an issue. Speaking about educating your child, what are the rules for educating your child in a foreign country? Like I remember, like all children, all people cannot afford to send their child to the international school. Sure, if you're on an expat assignment and your company's paying for it, but those are far and few between. Some countries don't allow foreigners to go to school with locals. So you need to think about, I just read uh, a post on Facebook where the children were having problems integrating into the school. Language is an issue. Age is an issue. Those are things that you need to think about. Where do you want your child to go to school? There are some kids who've been raised abroad. They may not go back to the United States until they're adults for college. I just sat in on a a seminar about how you can save for your child's education in most instances, you can do it the traditional ways of five, two, nine, things like that, where you can save. And again, you need to speak to an investment person because those are guided by states to figure out what's the best avenue for you to do if you want to continue to contribute to their education. Another thing to think about, what if your child has learning challenges? A lot of times overseas, the country you may be living in, they, they may not have an infrastructure to support that. It used to be a long time ago, if your child had any, your whole family, if you were going overseas, you needed a visa and you needed to be tested. If your child had certain disabilities, I remember a, a friend of mine, she was a lawyer and she was an immigration attorney for global corporations. I forgot. I think the child may have been in a wheelchair. The country is going to reject the family. No way. 
this was a long time ago, but even if they accept, are, are there going to be services that are available to your child? Do you want your child subjected uh, to the to extra scrutiny, not getting the services? There are lots of expat stories where the child maybe had a learning disability or maybe the child was on the spectrum and it went unnoticed by the school, right? I, I haven't really heard that many good stories about expat children and schools, even big international schools, being able to kind of diagnose and handle it. I wanted Lisa's opinion on the financial ramifications of having dual citizenship. And dual citizenship, permanent residency in another country, they're nice to have. The things that they can give you, maybe you can vote in all countries. You can take advantage of social services. That's a nice to have. When I have my work permit for the United Kingdom, in the back of my passport, they stamp, you're not eligible for any social services. So you run out of money or you have a problem, you're on your own. You have dual citizenship or you have residency in a country, you can do that. Also work authorization, the ability to work, that's good for that. Maybe you can own land, that's, that's good. But from a taxation perspective, the U.S. government, you're taxed on worldwide income if you're a U.S. citizen. I asked Lisa, what were the financial ramifications of renouncing citizenship, particularly American citizenship? Giving up your U.S. citizenship, which is just called expatriation. The U.S. government tracks the numbers, and it became a, a real trend after the laws around the, the taxes and FACA and FBAR. Something you need to think about, it's not easy uh, when I started to research it, it's not easy. It's not something I would do without professional advice because it's if you're a covered expat and then there could be a exit tax. It's not something to be done lightly. So I think about that. When I remember when people used to do it back in the day, a lot of wealthy people did it. Or if you're an accidental American, an accidental American is someone like Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson, the prime minister of the United Kingdom, he was born in the U.S., but because his father was studying here and he left when he was five and he didn't think about it again until he got ready to sign, sell a house. And the U.S. government was like, hey, you're going to have to pay taxes on those capital gains. He's kind of what you call an accidental American. Right. He didn't have any choice in that. I asked Lisa to talk more about her upcoming book and where all of you all could find it. Oh, my ongoing book, which I thought was going to uh, be easy, Global Money Matters, the smart money guide for expats, digital nomads, and travelers. And it basically hits on everything that we've discussed. So there's a chapter on compensation delivery, moving money, foreign exchange, credit, taxes, investment. And I'm always going to be committed to people who live a global lifestyle, whether I'm stateside or I'm living overseas, which I'll probably do again. But we need real advocacy. We really don't have anyone. We do have some organizations that have tried to advocate on, advocate on the, the, the needs of expats. But we could always need more help with it. Like voting is very important. A lot of expats don't even think about that. So that's my next thing. So the book is pretty much everything we've discussed and more. Because again, your financial needs, all the questions that you asked me were right on target. Those really haven't changed in the 20 plus years. What has changed are the rules, the United States government, the reporting, privacy, data, identity theft. Those are things we didn't think about before. So some things have changed, but not much. You still have the same financial needs, right? How are you going to get paid? What are your sources of income? How are you going to save, invest? pay for your child's education, pay for your taxes, find housing. Those things haven't changed. So that's kind of what the book and all the content is always about. I asked Lisa to share her definition of wellness with me and how living a global lifestyle had influenced her definition of wellness. I've always tried to focus on total wellness, starting with really mental, emotional, physical, and then financial career. To me, it's always been a total package. You have to have all of the things working in tandem. I think living abroad, that hasn't necessarily changed because 
especially to me, if you don't have your emotional and your mental health, your grit, your physical health can start to suffer. And one of the things that I remember with my attitude, I remember being in the hospital in China because like after three days, I started to feel better. But in China, they keep you in the hospital for like up to 30 days. But like, I was like, no, that, that is like, no, I'm getting out of here. And I was very, very focused. I was like, I'm putting on my black dress and my high heels and I'm walking out of here. Your, your mental, to me, your mental and emotional is always at the forefront, but I do believe in total wellness. I'm a big believer in living overseas is not a utopia. The grass is not always greener. It's just a different shade of green. And I think the lifestyle is different. And as we bring it towards finance, I think, you know, like my family teases me, like, Lisa, you don't have a maid here. You know, we're the only country that I know where working women are supposed to go out, make the bacon, clean the house. It's ridiculous. People, women in other countries think it's ridiculous. That's because it is. So in other countries where the costs are a little bit different, where you can have help. So when you put in a 15 hour day, you're not like, oh my God, I got to scrub the floor. I need to take care of the kids. I need to have dinner. That, that, that's to me a, a, a reason to have a different lifestyle overseas. So that, that, that I think has, has been like a big impact, just being able to see that. I know people hate that work-life balance, but I think People in other countries may not always have it, but they always seem to strive for it and they understand it. You tell people work-life balance in other countries, they get it. And it's acceptable to have help to get you there. The U.S., it's like work-life balance, what? And no, you don't need any help. You can just do it on your own and you can just... Now, I think that is going to change for the good, bad, or different with COVID-19. And we're having this whole working from home, location independent, and global corporations realize people don't need to be at their desks. I think we're going to see some changes. And I think those are changes for the better. I remember this was years ago. I was talking to someone. We were talking about living in London, which is an expensive city. But we said, although we live in a more expensive city and we get paid less, maybe our quality of life is always better. And I think that's what it comes down to. Right. It, it, it just always seems to to come down to your quality of life is better. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing your incredible story. If you want to keep up with Lisa, be sure to follow her on social media. So right now you can find me at livingagloballifestyle.com. I also have a Facebook page and hopefully soon I'm going to have a, a Facebook uh, group. I also have a page for Global Money Matters. So you can look on there because I post a lot of stuff, just articles, a lot of articles and stuff that I come across on finances for expats. But you can find me in a lot of Facebook groups. I have an Instagram account as well. I'm on Twitter, but I'm going to be making some changes. So the website is the best way, livingagloballifestyle.com and my Facebook page. And then I'm trying to come out with some freebies, some content, some games just all centered around living a global lifestyle and managing your finances while living a global lifestyle. So those are my real focus, helping people to live a global lifestyle since I've been doing it on and off for a long time. And again, managing your finances because even after 20 plus years, it's something people still don't really think about. Thank you all so much for listening. I hope to see all of you at the next live Q&A this Sunday with Jamila. And if you have not signed up for the Flourish in the Foreign Community, make sure you sign up so I can send you all the event details for this Sunday. I wanted to remind you all that I am a business strategist who specifically works with Black women and women of color, helping them to leverage their talents and their expertise into viable and sustainable online businesses so that they can pursue thriving lives abroad. If this is something that is interesting to you, if you are kind of frustrated figuring out how you are going to go abroad and be financially abundant and professionally fulfilled, please be sure to stop by my website, www.christinejobe.com 
and see how we can possibly work together and help you on your journey to thrive abroad. I'm also opening up my calendar because I've gotten a lot of questions and a lot of requests for some general expat consulting on how to get abroad, stay abroad, and thrive abroad. I am actually only going to have a limited amount of slots. So if you are interested in going abroad, if this is something you seriously want to pursue, not something you're thinking about kind of in general, but you are trying to make happen within the next, I would say, 12 to 18 months, definitely get on my calendar so we can chat and see how I can possibly help you. Okay, if you're still kind of thinking about it and it's maybe a couple more years down the line, definitely start attending the live Q&As because a lot of information is given out there and be on the lookout for the resources and the videos that are coming. There is another amazing event that I think all of you should attend. It is the Successful Black Women Summit Learn to Release the Hustle and enjoy the happy and the bliss from 24 experts, including myself. Yes, I'll be speaking at this summit as well. For one day only on October 17th, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Successful Black Women's Summit will be bringing you presentations from 24 industry experts who have found ways to ditch the hustle, prevent burnout, and secure greater success. The best part is that it is totally free. These presentations are totally free to you for the first 24 hours as long as you are registered. So please be sure to register with the Flourish in the Foreign link, which is available in the show notes and all the bios across all of our social media channels and on our website. You can also get your hands on the VIP Access Pass. With it, you'll get 10 talks from experts focused on everything from how to increase your brand presence to how to have healthy relationships without conflict, how to master your money mindset, and kick imposter syndrome. Please be sure to sign up. It is a free ticket. Be sure to register today. It is October 17th and use the Flourish in the Foreign link. If you identify as a woman of color podcaster, whether you are new to this game or you are true to this game, I want to bring to your attention the WOC Insiders Podcasters Membership. It is a membership that I am, in fact, a paying member. Yes, I pay to be a part of this membership. And it is such a wealth of information. It has really helped me to navigate this whole podcasting game. And so if you're interested in launching a podcast or if you are interested in elevating your own podcast, I highly recommend joining the WOC Insiders Podcasting Membership. You can do so through the Flourish in the Foreign Affiliate link, which is in our show notes, in the bio across all social media channels, and of course, the website. Please do join with our affiliate link is at no extra cost to you, but is another way for you to support this podcast. Thank you always to Zachary Higgs, who produced the music of this podcast. Zachary is an incredible musician, artist and producer. If you need music for your YouTube channel, your podcast or whatever your next project is, he is your guy. I will leave all of his information in the show notes as well. All right. That is it for this week. See you next week. On the next episode of Flourish in the Foreign. They really do understand what wellness is. Wellness is you work, but you don't kill yourself to do it. You grab a glass of wine, you take a breath, and you enjoy the beauty. They do have this appreciation of beauty and wellness. Like they build beautiful things. Even if they're dirt poor, their homes are beautiful. The landscaping is beautiful. They take care of their bodies. There's just such an appreciation of taking care of yourself, being well, living well, looking lovely, and not in a superficial way, in a meaningful way. 